So for me, I've had one job all my life. It is this job of uh, giving expression to the aspirations of the most challenged, those who are knocking uh, on the door, and those who are pushing back against consolidated power and authority. My family is uh, Haitian. My parents left Haiti during the 1960s, during the brutal dictatorship of the Trivalier regime. I was raised uptown in New York, uh, and I like to think of myself as a true uh, New York nationalist. Starting at around the time I was 16 years old, when I cut school to go uh, to demonstrations, and I found myself in the orbit of people like Jesse Jackson. And I dream of a day you will honor the broken promise. Harry Belafonte. For us in the movement, justice was the number one goal. John Lewis. Get him, Trevor! Good Trevor! Necessary Trevor! At that point, I was hooked, uh, and I understood that I would continue the work uh, of organizing, continue the work of lifting up collective voice, uh, and believing uh, in the power of ordinary people to do extraordinary things uh, to change the course of history. He who is greatest among you shall be a servant. Everybody can be great because everybody can serve. As a lifelong organizer, I'm really most excited to be in a place that's at the nexus of the world of ideas uh, and centers of uh, collective action. CAP is engaged in a broad cross-section of critical uh, issues on climate justice, racial justice, uh, eradicate uh, pandemics to expand uh, in, and create inclusive uh, health care of democratic access and preserving the integrity of uh, elections in this country and to create a path for a more perfect uh, union. Sometimes uh, you feel as if the challenges are greater uh, than any solutions that you're able to uh, surface and socialize in the body politic. And it's critical to have a space like CAP that provides a toolkit in the world of ideas, almost like a Swiss Army knife, uh, to determine uh, what can help you to advance progressive policy. I see that future through the prism uh, of uh, my son uh, and my daughter, uh, and that gives me uh, not just an anxiety, but a determination to act uh, and to act now uh, on their behalf. I'm really thrilled and inspired by the young people across this country feel galvanized with a fierce urgency of now. They are going to be heard. They are going to show up at the table. And if you denied them a seat at that table, they're going to reconfigure uh, the whole entire room. That is exciting. This is an hour where your resolve and your resources will be tested past breakage, but you will not break. Where we are 10 years from now, 20 years from now, on healthcare, on economic justice, on climate justice, and racial justice, and the very state of our democracy, all that will be traced back to what we do now in these next few short years. The challenges we face are mounting. The crisis are becoming more personal and more visceral, impacting lives and livelihoods. We have a chance to be bold, to act with courage, and to lift all Americans with a progressive vision. And CAP, where the best minds will come together and seek out a more hopeful path. It's on us to rise to this occasion, to meet this moment. Let's seize it. Good afternoon. I'm John Podesta, the chair of the Center for American Progress. Welcome to today's event, and what a great event we have in store. I'm not sure any lead-in can top the video you just watched. It shows the experience, the commitment, the sheer drive and determination we have leading us going forward. And that's why I'm beyond thrilled to call Patrick Gaspard, the president and CEO 
of the Center for American Progress. Eighteen years ago, when I founded CAP, the notion of what it meant to be a progressive and whether progressives could win national elections and wield power for the public good was very much in question. We had a Republican president and Republicans in control of both the House and the Senate. We had to ask ourselves, how could we actually build a society that lifted up the lives of all Americans? How could we shape a vision that captured the hearts and souls of the American people? How could we not only change the conversation, but change the country? And those considerations have been at the crux of our mission since CAP started. 18 years have passed, and it's humbling to say that CAP's been involved in many of the most historic acts in our nation. We've been at the forefront of expanding health care and shaping our nation's response to the pandemic and the resulting economic challenges, of addressing the scourge of racial inequity and the continued threats to our democracy, and of addressing the growing challenges of a nation and a world that's currently suffering from the pains of climate change. The challenges we face are as formidable as they are broad. And that's why I think in this vital moment, there's no person more suited to fully maximize CAP and CAP Action's capacity, both as a think tank and as an advocate, than Patrick. We need to lift up our unions, support good paying jobs, and have a worker-centered economy. Patrick's been doing that since his days as a union activist and a labor activist in New York. We need to tackle racial injustice and tackle the scourge of white supremacy. Patrick's been doing that since his days working alongside John Lewis and Nelson Mandela. We need to strengthen our democracy and push back against those who seek to undercut it and undermine it. Patrick's been doing that his entire life and no more so than as president of the Open Society Foundation. There he consistently called out the worst of authoritarianism and worked to lift up democracy, both at home and abroad. We need to work with allies and like-minded partners across the country and come together in pursuit of our common goals. That's something Patrick's been doing throughout his career, both as a member of President Obama's White House and as a longtime leader in the Democratic Party. And we need to work with our allies around the world. The progressive movement is a global one. The challenges we face are massive, and we need to match those challenges with the scale of our actions. As the former ambassador to South Africa, as a lifelong advocate of the Haitian people, Patrick's shown that his fight for progress operates on a global scale. It's driven by a desire to do good. And there's no better example of that than the fact that less than a month into his tenure at CAP, Patrick went down to Del Rio, Texas, down to the U.S.-Mexico border, and met with some of the thousands of Haitians who are seeking asylum. Too often, policy is hashed out far away from the people it affects. That's not where it belongs. Progressives do our best work when we articulate our values, clarify to the public what's at stake, measure our progress by real results, and never lack the courage to seek out the best solutions. Patrick knows that, Cap knows that, and that's why I'm thrilled to see what we can achieve going forward. So with that, I'll stop talking. I know you're not here for me, but for Patrick. So let me hand it over to Daniela gibbs Loger, Cap's Executive Vice President for Communications and Strategy. She'll introduce Patrick and our good friend, Congressman Hakeem Jeffries. Daniela. Thank you, John, and thank you to everyone for joining us today. I'll introduce Patrick and Representative Hakeem Jeffries in just a moment, but first, I want to echo those words. This is a momentous occasion, a new era for CAP. Speaking to staff across the building, I know just how deep the excitement runs. What Patrick brings to the table is exceptional experience and a vision for where we're going and what we can achieve. As someone who has worked at CAP for a combined 14 years, I am thrilled. But more than that, as a friend who's known Patrick for 24 years, I know we're in safe hands. Patrick and I go way back. My very first job out of college, my first political job, was working on the New York City mayor's race in 1997. And it was there that we first met. As a young person, not quite ready for the rough and tumble of New York City politics, I was lucky to have him there as a calming voice of reason. 
Through the years, we stayed connected and we were reunited again at the Obama White House in 2009. It is more than our shared politics that connects us. Like Patrick, I am the child of Caribbean immigrants, mine from St. Martin. I have deep ties to Haiti via my husband, whose family lives there and goes back generations. We are both children of the golden age of hip hop, though admittedly, I'm a little younger than he is. I just found out that we once literally lived on the same street in Brooklyn. And now we have come full circle and I have the honor and privilege of working alongside him. As John pointed out, Patrick has a long history in the progressive movement as a labor organizer, a member of President Obama's White House, as an ambassador, and as a president of the Open Society Foundation. His passion, thoughtfulness, and leadership are perfectly aligned with CAP, and I am so excited for what's to come. I'm thrilled to introduce him and thrilled to also introduce Representative Hakeem Jeffries, a longtime friend of Patrick's who will be moderating today's conversation. Congressman Jeffries represents the 8th Congressional District of New York. He is chairman of the House Democratic Caucus and the former whip of the Congressional Black Caucus. He also previously co-chaired the Democratic Policy and Communications Committee. Representative Jeffries, thank you for being with us today and let me hand it over to you. Thank you, Daniela. Uh, and thank you, John Podesta, for your leadership and for extending to me this invitation. Welcome uh, to this discussion uh, with the new president and CEO of the Center for American Progress, Patrick Gaspard. Uh, and I'm so thankful to the CAP family uh, for you joining us today and for all of the extraordinary work uh, that you continue to do. Patrick, congratulations uh, on your elevation. You've had an extraordinary career. It's good to see you, my brother. We both good to see you, brother. started out in different ways uh, here in Brooklyn. We're back uh, in Brooklyn. I guess that should be obvious based on the background. Um, if you didn't know, now you know. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Uh, now, y your career uh, has involved a lot of different amazing things that you've done, you know, to advance the cause of racial and social and economic justice in America. You started out uh, as a labor organizer and as a unionist with uh, SEIU 1199, Dr. King's favorite union. That's on the record, folks. I'm not making Amen. that up. Amen. Uh, you know, and then you were the director of White House Political Affairs. Uh, for President Barack Obama during his first term, helping to usher in extraordinary things like the Affordable uh, Care Act. I believe during his second term, of course, you were the ambassador to South Africa. What an amazing country, an amazing history, and an amazing time uh, to serve as ambassador. Uh, and then, of course, you were the CEO of the Open Society doing phenomenal uh, philanthropic and organizing work uh, again, to try to make life better for everyday Americans and, in fact, in that capacity for people all across uh, the world. Uh, and now you'll be or are the president uh, and CEO of CAP, uh, the Center for American Progress. How do you connect uh, those dots, all of which are extraordinary things, uh, but weave them together for our audience? Well, let me first open up by thanking you, Congressman. Thank you for engaging with me in this conversation. Thank you so much for the extraordinary partnership that you've provided uh, with CAP over the last many years. Thank you for your leadership and thank you for your brotherhood. When you walk through uh, elements of uh, my biography, it makes it clear that you and I have been at this game for more than just a minute. <laughs> We've been in the trenches together here uh, in Brooklyn and across the country, and it's just a tremendous honor to be able to continue to be in service with you. Uh, it's interesting, when you walk through all of that, uh, it seems as if um, there's a, a kind of eclectic, maybe even haphazard aspect to that journey, but there's, there are common threads uh, that run through it all. At the core of it for me uh, is this notion uh, that's been articulated by leaders like Nelson Mandela of servant leadership, which comes with a humility, which comes with uh, an inclination to uh, give back more uh, than you've been uh, blessed to receive uh, in one's life. Uh, and also comes with a notion that all of us are called to be in partnership with and communion with something larger and greater than ourselves. I, I came to this country as um, uh, an immigrant. Uh, my parents are from Haiti. Uh, I was born in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Uh, that happened because my parents were forced uh, out of their country by a brutal uh, dictatorship, uh, and they've always had a tremendous uh, appreciation for 
not just uh, the opportunities that exist uh, in this society, but the responsibility that we all have to fulfill the obligations of our citizenship by participating, by uh, partnering, uh, and making certain that we're building a more inclusive society. So everywhere I've been, whether it's uh, in SEIU, if you cut me, I'll, I'll bleed union, uh, or uh, now at CAP, I've always been animated by uh, this sense that uh, all of us uh, at the end of the day are uh, able to um, uh, exist and thrive uh, as a consequence of our reliance on uh, community. Now, you mentioned Nelson Mandela. Of course, I know he's had a uh, profound impact you know, on your life and on your journey, and has been a great inspiration throughout the world uh, for so many of us. I believe you were the ambassador to South Africa at the time uh, when Nelson Mandela passed. Is that correct? That is correct. So Tell us about that experience. Yeah, so I, I uh, had the experience of first meeting Nelson Mandela a um, long time ago, uh, about six months after he was released uh, from confinement. Uh, I uh, had been working with the Coalition of Black Trade Unionists, with Mayor David Dinkins, uh, and I was assigned to be the lead advance guide for his trip here uh, to the U.S., uh, to New York, ticker tape parade, uh, Yankee Stadium uh, concert, uh, town halls across the country was really quite uh, extraordinary. Uh, subsequent to that, I and he went to City College. Yeah, absolutely. But his first stop after leaving JFK was Bedford Stuyvesant. Bedford Stuyvesant. He went to Boys and Girls. There you go. Uh, man, very, very good. <laughs> yeah, we had to take care of Brooklyn first. That's just <laughs> we you know, appreciate that. We're the, the center of the known universe <laughs> here. <laughs> so, uh, subsequent to that, I, I had occasion to go to South Africa on a number, uh, number of times and uh, engage with the ANC and with other uh, uh, nascent political parties uh, in the country that had been unbanned and were trying to make their first steady steps uh, towards uh, building an inclusive society there. Uh, and then uh, when President Obama was reelected, uh, I had the opportunity to go and serve as U.S. Ambassador to South Africa, a country that I had been long obsessed with as a young activist in the anti-apartheid movement uh, here in the U.S. Uh, and um, Madiba <clears throat> transitioned uh, while uh, I was there. Uh, it was extraordinary. It was the, it was the, great, the biggest, largest uh, state funeral uh, since the uh, death of uh, Winston Churchill. Uh, there were over 130 uh, world leaders uh, who came, uh, and uh, including, uh, of course, President Obama, who traveled with President Bush and President Clinton uh, to that funeral uh, and delivered a stirring uh, address uh, about um, uh, what it means to build a more perfect union and the debt uh, that we as Americans uh, owe to the exercise of democracy in uh, South Africa. But that transition uh, enabled not just South Africa, not just Sub-Saharan Africa, but the whole world uh, to take stock, uh, look at the moment that we've arrived in, uh, in the trajectory of our journey, and to ask ourselves whether or not we were actually doing all we could to build a more inclusive society and a more broadly shared prosperity. So. Just uh, an extraordinary figure. Uh, but you know, uh, Hakeem, when I, th when I think about the journey and my experience uh, with issues uh, around apartheid and Pan-Africanism, I remember when I was 19 years old uh, and the body that you're in now, uh, U.S. Congress and uh, the Senate, uh, decided to exercise their override of Ronald Reagan's veto of uh, apartheid sanctions. I was 19, we had been protesting for years and it was clear to me at that time that collective action matters, that advocacy matters, uh, and that we as individuals have agency where ordinary people can do extraordinary things to change history. That got me hooked on organizing. When you reflect upon Nelson Mandela, the diva, this extraordinary world figure, reminds me of the story of Joseph uh, told in the Old Testament, someone who went from the prison to the palace. Uh, and it's interesting the trajectory um, that he followed as part of the journey that we throughout the world are endeavoring to follow. Uh, and you're a worldly figure. Uh, as you mentioned, you were born uh, to Haitian immigrant parents who fled uh, a dictator in Haiti, landed in the Democratic Republic of Congo, where you were born and then ultimately uh, made your way to the United States of America. This country has traditionally been a beacon uh, of democracy the so-called leader of the free world. Uh, in many ways, we've uh, lived up to that journey in an extraordinary fashion. But now, 
I think there's concerns here in America that democracy is more fragile than many people believed. And this was all crystallized by the January 6th violent insurrection. Given your family's history and your experience on the global stage, share with us your views on this moment uh, and some of the things that CAP is working on to try to address sort of the democracy crisis that we confront. Congressman, you have had a powerful conviction about the need to properly interrogate what occurred uh, on January 6th, and I applaud you for that. I think it's important for all Americans to recognize that uh, this is not a question of an isolated uh, incident of recklessness on the part of a few, uh, but it comes after years of a kind of demagoguery, a rhetorical slide, a pushback against a core set of uh, values that we thought uh, were a consensus uh, in uh, this country, irrespective of uh, party. Um, uh, regrettably, that's proven not to be the case, but, but we are fortunate uh, that there is a resilience uh, in our institutions uh, and a resilience in the democratic determination uh, of our uh, people to, to overcome this slide. The, uh, the authoritarian moment uh, that you describe is not isolated to the United States uh, at all. We're seeing this in the global north and in the global south. Uh, I think that there are twin pressures uh, at work here. Uh, we continue to see growing economic disparities, uh, great concentrations of capital, uh, wealth, power in the hands of an elite few uh, in societies across uh, the world. Um, that combined with the new ways that we communicate with one another uh, through the unregulated uh, tech platforms, social media that stirs all of us to some of our baser uh, instincts uh, has led us to this space of profound polarization. Uh, it's a, it's um, encouraged this instinct that we sometimes have as citizens to reach for the most simplistic uh, solutions to uh, our challenges. And regrettably, uh, there are figures who are skilled in exploiting uh, that, that need, that desire, uh, that instinct. Uh, at the Center for American Progress, uh, we have spent uh, a number of years working with congressional leadership and now uh, with the new administration trying to do all that we could to um, strengthen the scaffolding of uh, democracy uh, to make certain that we have electoral uh, integrity, which is really critical at a moment when we're seeing at this point 18 legislatures uh, in this country pass terribly regressive uh, laws that make it harder for people to exercise their franchise instead of easier uh, at a moment when uh, we're seeing the spread of the great lie uh, about what occurred uh, in the elections last year that's lifting up a kind of cynicism uh, and skepticism about the strength of our democracy uh, into uh, the future. We are looking at every way that we can across the board at the federal level and at the state level to innovate on expansion, on same day uh, participation, on lowering uh, the barrier for young people, for communities of color uh, to uh, be able to uh, show up, be heard, uh, and uh, be counted. But we're also, uh, I think, um, uh, Congressman, all of us together are, are making a new uh, and vibrant uh, investment in agency and voice at the community level, uh, at the level of uh, organizing around, ball uh, around the ballot. Uh, and around uh, the rights that are protected in the Attorney General's office in Congress uh, and beyond. Yeah, thank you so much for laying that out uh, in, such, in such a compelling way. It was interesting, the framers of the Constitution uh, had expressed concern during the founding of the Republic that one day uh, a demagogue might be elected as president who over four years could grow into a tyrant. Very interesting. Uh, they, had a, they had a lot of experience with that. They had a lot of experience with that, and they saw the dangers in that emerging, and you know, perhaps that's what we've been experiencing over the last uh, few years. But beyond putting it on the role that one particular individual skillful at manipulating human emotion and feelings and xenophobia and racism and misogyny may be, uh, you hit on two important points that we want to touch on a little later in terms of what may be undermining the fabric of our democracy. One, the immense concentration of wealth in the hands of a few and um, the erosion of that basic American dream. And I know under your leadership uh, and CAP's leadership, there's some 
uh, real efforts that are underway in terms of how do we provide a better pathway uh, toward opportunity and prosperity in every single zip code. We want to touch on that, uh, but uh, as we sometimes say in church, I'm going to park right here for a moment, uh, and I just want to touch on uh, your Haitian roots. Mm. Uh, as, as you mentioned, um, that you were born in the Democratic Republic of Congo, but to Haitian uh, parents, I know you're very proud of that. Haiti is an important country uh, in, in the world, in the African diaspora, in terms of the first free black republic in the Western Hemisphere, in many ways setting the stage uh, for the liberation that took place you know, here in America, but it's also a country that's been afflicted uh, with so many painful episodes, extreme weather events, hurricanes, earthquakes, recent political assassination um, of its president, extreme poverty, some political corruption, violence uh, in many parts of the land, and significant political corruption, extreme weather uh, events, uh, economic disparity. You could be describing uh, the circumstances uh, in uh, the, the country that we sit in right now. A con Congressman, you know that uh, questions uh, about Haiti uh, are near and dear to me. It's, a, it's obviously familial uh, yeah. and, and powerfully uh, intimate. Um, not that long ago, three weeks ago now, uh, I went to the border uh, at Del Rio. Border Anticipated where I was going. I did, I did. I, you know, I, I, tr I try to follow you. <laughs> uh, I try to follow your leadership. Uh, I went to the border at Del Rio because uh, all Americans saw the horrific images uh, at the border of our uh, customs patrol uh, agents on horseback using their reins uh, as weapons uh, against uh, asylum seekers, uh, refugees, many women uh, and children. Uh, I like to believe that the majority of Americans who saw those images were as appalled as I was. Uh, and I thought uh, that as a citizen, as the president for Center for American Progress, it was important to, to go down, uh, to uh, be in dissent, uh, to give expression to our aspirational sense of uh, what built this nation uh, and what will continue to make us strong into the uh, future uh, as we welcome the least of these. But I also wanted to, since you're, you know, you've taken us to church, I think sometimes we forget the importance of bearing witness, and I thought it was important to bear witness uh, as well. Uh, I'm pleased that as a, as a consequence of that visit to the border, I was joined by Reverend Sharpton, other civil rights leaders. Uh, we've seen some uh, action from the Department of Homeland Security uh, that's now moved to create a more transparent asylum process uh, for uh, those refugees. Uh, and we are now hearing from the President of the United States and the Vice President uh, a connection, a linkage, uh, and an understanding that the dislocation that we're seeing at the border uh, is cur cur directly tied to policies that have been enacted in Haiti, sometimes, regrettably, with the support of U.S. administrations, uh, of support of autocrats uh, in, uh, in Haiti. That's a, a, a powerful challenge. Uh, there's an extraordinary coming together of civil society in Haiti and the Haitian diaspora in the United States that's matured, that's become more sophisticated in its politics, uh, and is working uh, to build a more participatory society. Uh, I trust we're going to have the support of the Biden administration in that, and I applaud the, uh, the Congressional uh, Black Caucus for having long led uh, on uh, these issues. You know, you, you raised so, so many uh, value propositions uh, in uh, your question, though, uh, Congressman. Um, there is a unique and exceptional journey. Uh, you know, we talk about American exceptionalism, but I, sometimes I think we don't appreciate what it means. There's an exceptional journey uh, of immigration in the United States that's led to the, the strength and diversity uh, that we have, the strength and imagination and innovation. Uh, we're c the cultural leaders of the world precisely because uh, of the pathways that we've created for, uh, for citizenship for new Americans. Uh, in, in, man, in many respects, given the history of this country, we're all new Americans. Uh, and we have to recognize that and, and affirm that uh, into uh, the future. Uh, and affirm that as we think about how provisions uh, on education, health care, uh, how we take care uh, of the environment, uh, all of that is impacted by how we think about uh, our partnership with people all over the world. It's very important as you've laid that out, and as we talk about American exceptionalism, and you reference this, um, welcoming the least of these, out of many we are one, 
Uh, that, in many ways, is what has made America a great country. Uh, and that immigrant spirit you know, of working hard and playing by the rules, which is the basic American contract. You work hard, you play by the rules, you should be able to provide a comfortable living for yourself and for your family, contribute to the broader economy uh, in a phenomenal way, and be able to retire with grace and dignity. But for far too many Americans, uh, that basic American contract has been stamped null and void. Talk to us about your vision uh, and CAP's work in the area of dealing with the economic crisis that we continue to confront, exacerbated by COVID. But prior to the pandemic, half the American people reported that they couldn't afford a sudden, unexpected $400 expense in the wealthiest country in the history of the world. This is extraordinary. And what's CAP, not to put too much pressure on you, what's CAP going to do about it? Well, Congressman, you give uh, concise expression to uh, the, the notion of the compact, uh, the opportunities that we have, uh, and the crisis that's presented to us. This is precisely why uh, I thought that in this moment, uh, the Center for American Progress was the place that I needed to come and, and, and help uh, take up my, uh, my, my service. Uh, I'm just ex enormously proud uh, that at CAP, we've been engaged uh, in these questions for some time. Uh, and have lifted up uh, policy proposals, uh, prescriptions for thorny issues uh, that are at the center of the Build Back Better uh, legislation, the infrastructure legislation, uh, the reconciliation debates uh, that you and your uh, colleagues are, are currently uh, engaged in. You know, the, I think that uh, COVID uh, and all it's exposed uh, to us uh, about uh, the essentiality uh, of certain uh, communities of, of, of workers, for instance, and the incredible vulnerability that we have here in the richest uh, nation in the history of the world, that's give a, given us an opportunity to pull back, widen the aperture, ask ourselves these difficult questions again, uh, but create new um, uh, uh, roadmaps uh, towards a, a North Star uh, of inclusion. Uh, you know, I'm, you, you, you talk about the founders. I'm, I'm, a, I'm, I'm, I'm a Lincolnist. Uh, and I remember what Lincoln said at the eve of uh, the Civil War, uh, where he turned uh, to Congress uh, and to the nation and said, the fiery trial through which we pass will light us down in honor or dishonor to the latest generation. Each generation in America has an opportunity to decide if we're going to be uh, led down the path of honor or dishonor. This is a moment uh, for absolute uh, courage uh, and boldness uh, and uh, honor. So at CAP, we've lifted up a number of pillars that we think are, are critical to fulfilling the compact that you describe, uh, Congressman. First and foremost, as we emerge uh, from this pandemic, it's important that we stand up uh, and expand access to uh, resilient systems of health care uh, in this country. We know so much about the prescription drug donut hole. We know uh, that we have uh, a whole industry, big pharma, uh, that uh, is able to innovate as a consequence of public taxpayer uh, dollars invested in R&R, but then they charge 70 times uh, the amount uh, that it costs them to, to make a medication. Uh, and our seniors are making really tough decisions about paying rent or cutting their pills in half. We have an opportunity right now, today, in this Congress to change that. I'm proud that CAP has been at the fore of leading uh, on this issue. We talked about uh, the great uh, economic dislocations uh, that we're uh, faced with. Uh, there is an existential threat to the integrity of our uh, democracy, all democracies around the world, uh, to, to be clear, around this question of building uh, truly inclusive uh, economies uh, for all. That is linked, that's linked to the challenge that we've had um, in this country of fulfilling our obligation uh, on uh, racial justice. There's a relationship between these things. Right now, in the Build Back Better legislation, you and your colleagues are attempting to uh, finally uh, make whole a whole class of workers that have been excluded from American promise uh, in, the, in the past. We, we know that during the, the New Deal, for instance, home care workers, who I was proud to have been an organizer uh, on behalf of, were excluded from the promise uh, of, the, of the New Deal, racialized politics, uh, excluded from the great society uh, in the 1960s. And now uh, you and your colleagues are making sure that as we build an inclusive economy, we're thinking about the care economy, dominated by mostly women who are early childhood uh, teachers, who are home caregivers, one of the fastest expanding 
uh, industries and sectors uh, in healthcare, which is the fastest growing sector in our economy. Uh, and you're making sure that as it grows, we're including all as we make uh, progress. Another key component for me of uh, CAP's leadership and what we're trying to center uh, in uh, the animated public debate now uh, is the future of uh, climate. Uh, I'm excited that uh, this Congress and this President have set uh, some really ambitious uh, standards on land preservation, but really powerful aspirational standards on the elimination of carbon uh, emissions uh, by uh, 2050, passage of current bills, uh, and the continued advocacy street by street, community by community, state by state is going to be critical uh, for us to have uh, not just lower emissions, but climate justice in communities that, that have had to live in environment degradation for far too long as a result uh, of poverty. And then there's this whole big question that I know you're engaged in, uh, which is uh, how we hold this all uh, together. You touched on January 6th. January 6th is a date that will live in all infamy, but uh, it's part of a long history uh, in our country uh, of uh, this kind of polarization that leads very quickly to political violence. There is a history of that in our, uh, in our, in our country. It's in, an inescapable uh, history. Uh, and we have to determine together what we're doing uh, in, in, in building a resilient uh, democracy uh, and in uh, engaging uh, with those who don't necessarily uh, share our prescriptions but share our, 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 our deeply held uh, values and instincts about uh, our country uh, to get to the other side of these challenges. Yeah, political violence, uh, as you point out, is part of the ugly underbelly uh, of the American journey. And last year, we just paused on recognition of the 100-year anniversary of the Tulsa race riots, one of the largest race riots in the country, where um, Black Wall Street as a community was burnt down to the ground. Um, linked to the racial polarization that existed in the society at the time and that while we've come a long way, we of course still uh, have a long way to go. You made so many important points, but uh, that, that connection between the robustness of democracy uh, and the stability of working families, middle class families, those who aspire to be part of the middle class is so uh, critical. I'm thankful for your vision in that area and for CAP's work. I think it was Brandeis uh, who once observed that in America you can have democracy or you can have wealth concentrated in the hands of the very few, uh, but you can't have both. And we, we, we just have to deal with creating opportunity for everyone. And what you laid out as part of the Build Back agenda uh, is so essential. I know CAP is also focused on uh, dealing with the public health aspect of the crisis as well. Uh, and has given a lot of thought to um, the disparities that existed in this country prior to the pandemic that have been exacerbated uh, by the pandemic. Can you speak about your vision in, in the area of public health as it relates to the moment we're in? Well, Congressman, you mentioned the fact that even before the pandemic, we had close to half the country that could not afford a $400 uh, emergency in their lives. Uh, tragically, those uh, emergencies, more often than not, uh, are healthcare emergencies, challenges they have with aging parents or with children who have accidents or other um, uh, difficult circumstances that lead them to uh, an emergency room. And we have a profound crisis in mental health care in this country, particularly in low-income uh, communities uh, of color. Uh, CAP has been engaged on the question of uh, health care um, uh, disparities, health care deserts uh, that exist uh, in uh, this country. Uh, the need to make sure that we are properly and appropriately deinstitutionalizing uh, the care of our senior population. We actually saw uh, the challenge of what it means to live in congregate uh, settings uh, during COVID uh, for seniors. Uh, and so increasing the investment that we're able to make uh, in uh, home health uh, direct care creates a, a more dignity uh, at that point of life, but also increases um, uh, health care uh, outcomes uh, as well. Uh, it's abundantly clear that uh, the lives of millions of Americans have been positively transformed uh, as a result of the passage of uh, Obamacare, uh, which was much uh, disparaged, uh, which took, uh, I think, far too long for some of its best virtues and benefits to be felt uh, by the American public. But once those uh, benefits have been felt, 
uh, there is a sense uh, that uh, lives have been uh, greatly improved, greatly enhanced uh, as, a re as a result of that. So as we think about uh, access to essential uh, medicines, uh, as we think about um, uh, the cost of um, uh, the investment that we make uh, in the education of our young people, which is tied directly uh, to healthcare outcomes uh, in uh, our communities, we have to also appreciate that these investments on the front end, um, which you know can sometimes make uh, the deficit hawks uh, a little anxious, uh, end up uh, lowering uh, the price of access uh, well uh, into the future. We also have to understand as we think about healthcare, and this is something that CAP uh, has been um, uh, at, the f at, the, at the forearm. We also have to understand that um, despite the hyper-sovereign politics that exists uh, in our country, we don't have the ability to build a moat uh, around our country uh, and to pull up the drawbridge uh, when it comes to health care. If it wasn't clear to us before, it should be abundantly clear to us now as a result of uh, COVID. Outcomes uh, in health uh, in Latin America, in Europe, in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, are interconnected uh, to the outcomes that we have. One of the most extraordinary uh, investments that this country has ever made uh, is the investment that President Bush uh, and Congress made in PEPFAR, a program to uh, eradicate AIDS around the world, particularly in Sub-Saharan Africa, because President Bush understood uh, at that moment uh, that that would redound eventually to the benefit of Americans uh, on Main Street. That proved to be the case then. Uh, and I think that as we think about our investments uh, in healthcare, the leadership that the CBC and others have provided on helping to stand up uh, an African uh, CDC, the partnerships that we have with the World Health Organization uh, and other multilateral uh, institutions are, are critical for uh, ensuring uh, improved access and benefits for Americans as well. Yeah, no, I think um, we, are, we are not on an island. We, we are not on an island. It's a profound point that you make. And that partnership uh, around PEPFAR with President Bush and Speaker Pelosi uh, at the time led by, you know, Barbara Lee and the Congressional Black Caucus really, you know, is a phenomenal model um, that we should be able to continue to build upon. We aren't uh, on an island, notwithstanding the fact that we've got the Pacific and the Atlantic and we've always thought <laughs> that right. that would protect us from the rest of the world. It does not in the context of public health. It doesn't, and we're not on an island in our individual communities. There's an important discussion that's taking place right now about the expansion of Medicare uh, in, this, uh, in, in this country for uh, vulnerable populations. Uh, if, we, if we look at all the, the challenges that we've seen uh, in uh, COVID, the very high um, uh, cont spread rates uh, amongst lower, lower income uh, zip codes, that are side by side with more elite uh, zip codes who have been protected uh, in those moments, but who are also increasingly vulnerable uh, as well because of the lack of access that, that exists uh, in more vulnerable communities. All of these things are interrelated. We've got to make these investments. So we've talked about the economic crisis that we confront, the democracy crisis, the public health crisis, touched a little bit uh, on the need to deal with the climate crisis uh, with the fierce urgency of now as part of the Build Back Better Act. I want to end uh, with a focus on, I think, the, the last of the five major crises that we're confronting uh, at this moment. That's the racial justice crisis. Uh, but I want to start by reflecting in part and connecting it to the journey uh, that, that you've been on, not just as we talked about, I didn't mention your involvement in the election of the first black mayor uh, here in New York City, David Dinkins, and then uh, involved in the election of the first black president. Uh, and prior to transitioning into the Obama administration, uh, you served as the political director for the Obama campaign. What an extraordinary uh, effort, extraordinary moment for this country. You, uh, I think it'd be fair to say, you would never uh, acknowledge this, you're too humble, but you had Axelrod, you had Pluff, you had Jarrett, and right up in there, in the room with the soon-to-be president was Patrick Gaspard as the political director. Uh, what is it that you all saw in electing America's first black president, which many people didn't think was possible? What did it mean for the country? Um, some said it came to signify a new post-racial America. We've seen that that was not necessarily the case, but it was meaningful and incredible progress beyond the amazing public policy accomplishments, including the Affordable Care Act. But what did that moment uh, 
that you were involved in mean for the country? I've been pretty lucky, haven't I? I've been in some, <laughs> I've been in some amazing places. Uh, thank you for reminding me of that. You know, um, uh, it made a difference then. It continues to make a difference into our, our future. I was at Howard University a few days ago having a conversation with brilliant students who are going to, you know, really be running laps around you and I in the, ver in the very uh, near future. Uh, and I reminded those students of an address that Lyndon Johnson gave at Howard in 1965 when he uh, came, had a conversation with the graduating class there and delivered a, 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 a stirring address about what it means to fulfill uh, our promise uh, as a, a, a country, our promise uh, laid out in our foundational uh, documents. He said in that address, you can't uh, have somebody who's been in chains t for years, you take off the chains and you put them at the starting line of the Olympic race, st uh, sound the gun, uh, and believe that they're going to have the same opportunity to succeed and win that race as the other uh, participants who have been unchained, well-fed, uh, and, uh, and trained uh, for the moment. It's not possible and it's irrational uh, in our politics uh, that we think that uh, following the moment of emancipation, the challenges uh, that were uh, visited on a community during Reconstruction, the recalcitrant uh, efforts to take us back in time during the Civil Rights Movement, right up through uh, the moments in the 1980s when some were determined to dismantle uh, the, the, the social safety net, which of course had a great impact on, on uh, African Americans, communities of color uh, in uh, this, this country with the ongoing challenges that we have. The election uh, of Barack Obama was not just about the election of one man. That came out of an extraordinary movement of average people across this country who understood their agency in this democracy, who uh, knew what it meant uh, to organize, uh, to uh, give voice to um, uh, their uh, expectations of democracy and justice and, and the common uh, welfare and who designed and developed a mandate that they could uh, animate uh, in a way that drove a particular kind of electoral outcome. So tens of millions uh, of Americans who were engaged uh, in that. First time I met um, uh, President Obama, he was a state senator uh, in Chicago who had the audacity to run for uh, U.S. Senate. Uh, I met him uh, in a small group meeting uh, where he was making his pitch uh, on U.S. Senate. And I recognized immediately that this was somebody who had the ability to take up generations of history in this country, complicated policy ideas, uh, and articulate them in a way that was not only accessible, but also galvanizing. Um, that spark uh, that he had uh, comes from a, a widely developed instinct uh, in our communities, uh, in our people, who have long uh, strove for justice, from uh, Harriet Tubman, uh, to the work that um, uh, young Black Lives activists are engaged in uh, today. That will continue, that instinct will continue to animate in, uh, our organizing uh, on uh, universality uh, of health care, uh, on what it means to have proper uh, exercise of the franchise uh, in this country, on what it means to push back from the worst reactionary elements uh, who would do harm uh, and violence to us. Uh, the, the moment of Barack Obama being uh, elected president uh, is a huge historical moment. But for me, uh, it's almost uh, similar to the sensation that I had when I saw young sister Bree Newsom climb up the flagpole uh, in South Carolina and decide that as an individual citizen, she was going to end the debate uh, about um, the, the brutality uh, represented uh, in the Confederate flag. There's a, there's a dotted line for me that connects these two moments in history because at the end of the day, uh, they are about individual instinct, aspiration, joining uh, a collective uh, mobilization uh, for change that speaks to foundational promises uh, that, are, that are yet uh, unfulfilled. Uh, we're still uh, in that moment uh, and we'll still continue to draw uh, inspiration from it. We'll, we'll be critical of it and interrogate what that election meant, what it represented, what it didn't, what we accomplished, what we haven't, uh, but use it uh, as a way of um, making a determination about how we impose our own will uh, on the arc of justice into the future. It's very powerful. Uh, we, we've got less than uh, three minutes remaining in our conversation. It's oh, gone no, by we're incredibly having such a good fast. Time. <laughs> uh, and uh, I just appreciate you know, all that you've shared with us, with 
uh, CAPS audience, uh, and I'm looking forward to the tremendous leadership that you're going to provide. America's at a crossroads uh, right now. We can go down either one of two roads. We can go down the road of authoritarianism, which we're closest to than perhaps at any point in our history, certainly since the Civil War. But we can continue a long, necessary, and majestic march toward a more perfect union. What gives you hope uh, that we're going to be able to continue that march toward a more perfect union? You know, uh, Congressman, I think the thing that gives me uh, the greatest lift uh, to my spirit uh, is the new forms of activism that we're seeing uh, in, this, in this country. There are questions that are being asked by this new generation of participants uh, in uh, d uh, democratic practice uh, in America that you and I did not even dare uh, to ask. You know, I, I like to say that um, years ago, when I was you know, working with activists to shut down the Brooklyn Bridge after Amadou Diallo uh, had been um, uh, killed uh, by police officers, I had a desire for justice, I had a hope for justice, but I didn't have what these young activists have, which is an expectation of justice in their own lifetimes. They're demanding it. Uh, when I look out and I see demonstrations, when I see protest movements, when I see sophisticated advocacy by young people, I recognize that that advocacy is so much more diverse uh, than uh, what, it, what I experienced uh, in, my, uh, in our generation when I'd go and I'd look around at a demonstration, everybody there looked like me, sounded like me, had the same sort of experiences, but now we're seeing a cross-section of Americans who are coming together, who are lifting up a uh, voice and who are saying, we can do better, we demand more uh, of ourselves, we expect more uh, and better in this time, we understand that we are connected uh, to others uh, who are seekers of justice around the world. We're going to make common cause with them, uh, and together we can lift up a powerful song uh, that's going to uh, transform the historic direction of this country. That's a beautiful thing. That inspires me uh, every day uh, and makes me um, incredibly humble to be able to uh, serve on the policy front uh, that spirit. Patrick Gaspard, President and CEO of the Center for American Progress. Good luck. My brother. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you, my brother. Hey, everyone. Greetings from Texas. Uh, let me just start off by saying a huge thank you uh, to all the staff of the Center for American Progress. Uh, I want to let you know how proud I am of CAP's efforts. I don't have to tell anybody that these last 18 months have been unlike any time that any of us have ever experienced. And our nation has been challenged in so many ways by losing more than 700,000 lives to a pandemic, a recession that came with it, that continues to affect millions of Americans who find themselves still out of a job or their small business shuttered, or they find themselves on the brink of eviction or already homeless through a racial reckoning after the murder of George Floyd and through the continued attacks on our democracy, not only on January 6th, but in state legislatures across this country. Through all of that, CAP has been a consistent voice for progress with a progressive vision that says, we can build a nation where everyone has the opportunity to live a life of dignity where everyone counts. I'm proud to be a part of an organization that is so committed to making sure that we learn the lessons of this pandemic and that we create that kind of nation that all of us can be proud of. The good news is that as we sit here in October of 2021, due in no small part to a lot of the work that CAP has done over the years and due to great policymakers in Washington, DC, in some state legislatures across the country, and of course, to the American people. We have a tremendous opportunity to get closer to our vision of that country through the American Rescue Plan that is already in place and also through the Build Back Better Plan, which promises to make foundational investments, transformative investments in everything from childcare to affordable housing, to economic opportunity for the most vulnerable Americans. 
I want to commend all of the hard work that CAP staff members have done over the years and recently to help forward this vision and to help turn it into something that we can implement. And so it's the perfect time for Patrick Gaspard's leadership at CAP. Over the years, Patrick himself has been a visionary and one committed to that vision, whether it was through the labor movement, working in the Obama administration, serving as an ambassador, working in open society, or leading our effort here to work with the Biden administration so that we can build that nation where everyone counts. Thank you, Patrick, for your leadership. I'm so excited to work with you. And I know that everyone at CAP shares that sentiment. And for those who are watching, I hope that as CAP begins this new chapter, that you'll lend your support to CAP's efforts to create our progressive vision for America. I hope you'll consider making a tax deductible contribution to the leadership fund at CAP to help ensure that this work happens. You can contribute at www.americanprogress.org slash leadership fund. Let's go out and build that America we can all be proud of. Thank you.